Hey, Doug. A live person that's not a techie person. <laughs> see today Maybe ask again. Sorry, I just to oh sure hey when, hello everybody online so far um would someone like to do umzi today can anyone hear me okay so uh I, Andrew, but my i don't want to do umzi <laughs> <laughs> that's fair <laughs> Anybody else? So I, I guess I'll do whimsy then. Um, looks like we have just another minute. Okay. Um, do we start with that? Or praise to Shakyamuni Buddha? Okay, can you, Eli, can you put the seven line prayer back up? What's that? Do we just do it the once? Three times, okay. So good morning, everybody. Um, I think probably everyone knows me. I'm Andrew, I'm Andrew Smith, Sangha member, giving our uh, Dharma talk today. And uh, we're going to start with prayers. Um, we'll start with the seven line prayer of Guru Rinpoche. Mm -hmm. 
Now we'll do praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, bow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, bow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, 
well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. With the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen, and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Idam, Guru, Ratna, Mandalakam, Nyaya, Tiyami. Now the heart of the perfection of wisdom sutra. I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear at one time. A Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Raja Griha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharavati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, Therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, 
no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no ignorance, it's no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly, completely awaken the unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, Tayata, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhisoha. I'll recite this 20, we can recite this 21 times to ourselves. Tayata, gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharavati Putra, the Mahasapa, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Hello, everybody, live and uh, on the computer at your homes, I assume. So I hope everyone's doing well today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the role of pain in Buddhism. Um, I have been working, many of you know, I'm a psychologist and I work um, part time at Middleway Health and part time at a, a, a county uh, medical clinic and a lot of what I do at this clinic is work with uh, in a chronic pain clinic with patients that are referred to us and um, it's pretty intense work it's makes me think a lot about the parallels between pain and Buddhism and I wanted to kind of explore that with you today I'm not even sure where I'm supposed to be looking <laughs> there we go okay <laughs> so um, and I'll also look at the few people that are here so um, the reason that I'm there as a psychologist in the pain clinic is twofold. Um, one is um, that there is a very significant mind-body aspect to pain that we'll explore some today. And also to help motivate the patient to want to consider an alternate pain treatment than the one that they're on that's not working for them, but they're kind of clinging very desperately to it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that experience in a minute, but I want to give you a few statistics on chronic pain. Um, 50 million people approximately um, in this country have chronic pain. I'm sure that uh, many people in, in our Sangha, when you think about that, that's 20% of people in our country have chronic pain. So it's extremely common. 8% um, of that chronic pain for people is disabling. So 8% of people 
in this country are disabled by their chronic pain, which means that they have a hard time uh, working, fulfilling uh, many of their, their daily life tasks. It's, it's significantly impairing their functioning. Chronic pain rates are higher in older adults, adults in poverty, adults with less education, rural adults, and adults with public health insurance. So basically, this is my patient population that I'm working with at the county hospital. One thing that is very clear for, to me working with these patients and from the literature is that um, current and past experiences, whether or not they're related to pain, play a significant role in the pain experience. Um, and certainly an, an early pain experience can then um, kind of morph into how the patient experiences pain from then on. The earlier the pain experience, the more reactive that they're likely to be to later pain. So we can oftentimes I'll do a, a pain history with the person and we can start to see this, this genesis of where this acute pain started to morph into this chronic pain because not every, everybody has acute pain. No one has escaped that yet. Um, what makes it morph into chronic pain is multifactorial. Sometimes it's just the disease process of whatever is going on. Uh, and sometimes it's, like I said, it's the person's experience with the pain. And so um, I've seen patients have a reaction to pain that um, is extremely disabling. Um, patients in their 20s in wheelchairs, um, patients that are temporarily paralyzed by their pain. And doctors are, are flummoxed because they cannot find, you know, they, they image them uh, in multiple ways and they can't find a, a source that would explain why they're so disabled by their pain. Um, these patients tend to frustrate their doctors, maybe understandably in the sense that, you know, doctors like to be able to find a source for pain. And, and when they can't, uh, and the patient continues to experience pain, they can feel somewhat, um, as, as physicians, I think, helpless and hopeless. Um, and this is where um, you'll start to see patients put on opioid medications. Um, opioids work, don't get me wrong. Uh, they're, they're very um, helpful for acute pain, um, a broken bone or, or post-surgery, things like that. Uh, the problem is when they begin to be used for chronic pain, they lead to physiological dependence where the person um, feels worse when they're not taking it. That's known as hyperalgesia, where the pain actually worsens when, they, um, when it's leaving their system, which t sends a message to the patient that um, I need the opioid. See, it's working because when it's not in my system, the pain is much worse. So it starts this cycle of dependence. Um, and, and for many of these people, it leads to what's called tolerance, which is where they need more and more of the opioid to get the same result. So the patients in our clinic, one of the defining criteria is they have to be at least on 90 morphine milligram equivalents of, it's kind of technical language, but of, of an opioid. To, to see us and basically means that doctors have escalated the dose of their medication to such an extent that there's kind of they can't go forward and it's really hard to turn back. And um, a lot of doctors nowadays don't even want to touch opioid medication and so the the patient um, doesn't know what to do. Um, if their doctor retires and the uh, patient is on a high dose of opioids and they are trying to find a doctor who's going to prescribe it. They're often very stuck. They, they might end up in the emergency room over and over. Or sadly, this is one of the reasons why we have um, a crisis of um, heroin and, and fentanyl. You know, the opioid crisis is, has many reasons for it. Um, it's not just pain, but there's definitely a role that the initial over-treatment and now under-treatment of pain, um, it's kind of like the pendulum swung all the way back the other direction. Um, has really created another kind of a crisis. So uh, the doctor that I work with is working to gradually reduce these patients off of their short-acting opioids. And um, there's a medication known as Suboxone, which is 
an opioid uh, antag no opioid agonist, but it's longer acting and it's safer to be on. It doesn't have as many um, interaction effects. Because patients, it's not uncommon, not, I wouldn't say it's super common, but it can happen that patients die from a combination, toxic combination of the opioid they're on and another medication. So it's very risky to be on long-term opioids. So these patients come to our clinic uh, frustrated because their doctor stopped prescribing to them. Um, all they want is their opioid. Um, it creates kind of a, um, not just a physiological, but psychological dependence. And uh, they get a little bit of relief, but they're, most of the patients that we see are disabled. They're not working. They have significant issues with depression and anxiety. Um, and all they want is the opioid. It, it kind of reminds me of the hungry ghost realm. They get, they get a little bit of a, a mild relief from the pain, but they're living this life of a very diminished existence that's pretty much entirely defined by their pain. It's really quite tragic. Um, and when they come to see me, I mean, when I come in the room as uh, Dr. Smith, the psychologist, uh, the, the very common experience they have is, wh why is a shrink here? My pain is real. It's not in my head. And they become kind of offended by the fact that I'm there. So um, it's it's hard for me to kind of start with them to help them to understand a, a, a different way of thinking about things when they don't really want to see me. So I have to ingratiate myself a lot. So there's a lot of research and literature in, in pain treatment that explains that the patient's perception of pain largely determines their experience of pain. I've heard it said that the way we think about and attend to our pain is like the volume knob on the experience of our pain. On the surface, it makes logical sense, but there's frequently a denial about it that, that borders on delusion. So I, I'll offer two examples on each end of the spectrum for um, the perception of the pain and, and how it determines the experience of the pain. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, we have the soldier in a battlefield who is shot and they do not experience the pain of the, the gunshot wound because all of their mental energy is focused on basically kill or be killed. They have to survive the experience that they're in. And it's, it's usually not until they're off the battlefield that they experience the pain. So the pain is, um, the volume knob is turned down kind of by necessity in that experience. On the other end of the spectrum is an example that was written up in the British Medical Journal of a construction worker who, uh, on the work site, uh, fell on a nail, stepped on it, kind of landed on the nail, and it went all the way through his boot. And he was screaming in pain. His coworkers rushed him to the hospital, screaming the whole way, rushed him to the emergency room. The doctors cut away his boot and found that the nail went right between his toes. And so that's where an ex a perception of pain creates the experience of the pain. That's kind of obviously an extreme example, but that I think it illustrates how the perception determines the experience. The mind is very susceptible to pain messages. Um, the, the main model that we have um, still in America, in Western medicine is what's known as the biomedical model that, that doctors operate from, which is that, uh, for example, with pain, it's that pain has uh, a physical source and a physical solution. We will do x-rays, MRI, some sort of imaging that's going to find the source of your pain. And then we have an intervention, be it pain, uh, pain medication or um, surgery or uh, some sort of you know, spinal cord stimulator. There's something that we can do that will um, take care of your pain. Um, this is pretty much reinforced by the entire kind of setup, um, the way that physicians document, um, insurance billing is all based on this biomedical model. So it's, it gets reinforced for the patient that their, your pain is has a physical source. Um, an example of this um, is MRIs for back pain. 
50% of back pain has no known medical origin. And when they do image and they find disc degeneration, it's not necessarily correlated with back pain. But if, if the doctor tells the patient you have a degenerative disc disease, doesn't that sound terrible? Um, it's not necessarily correlated with pain. For example, 37% of people who are age 20 have degenerative discs. They did a study on, and that number just goes up. And most of those people are not in pain. They don't even experience that. They just happen, if you happen to give them an MRI, you'll find some degeneration there. Another interesting study was with uh, Olympic athletes where they found that 50% of them had moderate to severe degenerative discs. And these are, are people who are obviously not disabled. In fact, they're operating at the, at the peak of athletic physical capabilities. If you show someone, uh, you know, your back imaging that's showing this, a lot of them then will start to uh, manifest with more pain and, and more disability from, from seeing that there's a real problem. The disc doesn't even have a nerve ending. So there's a power in the story of where the pain comes from that can sometimes be reinforced over and over by the medical system. And again, sometimes it is a very real, um, I never want to say pain's not real. It's even the perception is real, but it's, it's, um, it's not real the way we think of real, kind of like in Buddhism, the um, conventional reality is not real the way we think it's real. So um, there's one way of thinking about pain is that it's a signal. Something is happening, we can say, when, when pain is happening, something is happening. How we interpret the pain depends on how we experience it. So you can do an example, if you like, um, on this. Uh, you can take your finger and just slowly start bending it backwards. Don't do this, Connor. <laughs> um, and what you'll notice is it just bend it back until the point where it starts to hurt. And what you'll notice is that you have, and you can stop. What you'll notice is you haven't hurt yourself. It's just sending you a warning, keep going and you will. So um, when the person's in chronic pain, they experience it as if they have been injured and they begin to um, limit their activities. Um, and at its worst, this leads to an unnecessary disability for many people. So I've been talking a lot about pain. You're wondering, Maybe how does this relate more to Buddhism, right? Because here we are, I am in a temple, some of us. So chronic pain is this projection of fixedness and solidity onto the pain experience might be one way we think, we think about it. Uh, when we examine it, we see that there is nothing at all solid about it. The solidity is in our projection. It's like how our projection of a fixed and independent existence onto phenomena and self leads to our suffering. Even in the worst pain conditions, it isn't solid, but it's variable and intermittent. Such, it sends such a strong signal that we project solidity onto the experience. It's like based, it's like, uh, based on our senses, we project solidity onto all of our lived experience. The meaning the person puts on the pain experience leads to suffering. Pain plus resistance equals suffering is a, a formula that I've heard. Pain plus resistance equals suffering. There's a bi-directional, what they call bi-directional relationship be between pain and afflictive emotions. Again, something I see quite a lot in, in the chronic pain clinic. So if you're living with pain for long enough, it's going to um, impair your quality of life. You're going to get pretty down. Um, we see people feeling very depressed and sometimes anxious uh, about this pain. It's, it's hard to have uh, a positive outlook when you feel so bad all the time. We also see patients that had, have underlying depression and anxiety that may predate the pain tend to have higher levels of pain. They, the, the pain scale, which is entirely subjective of you know, one to 10, they will self-report much higher levels of pain than other patients. And again, it's like those afflictive emotions are turning the volume knob up on the pain experience. 
In the face of powerful sense experiences, of which pain is one, we tend to lose mindful awareness and go into fight or flight as if we were in immediate danger. These bodily experiences send danger signals to the mind, which feeds it back to the body that something's wrong. And so this feedback loop just happens and we can stay in this state of chronic stress. This is something we see a lot in trauma. Um, trauma leads to direct bodily experiences. Um, you probably have all heard of the fight or flight response. It's the autonomic nervous system engaging to um, help people to, you know, live in whatever situation that they're in, to fight off the danger or to flee from the danger. Um, this can start to kind of, for lack of a better way of putting it, can kind of burn a neural pathway that this past experience determines how we, we interpret all of our current experiences, or not all, but m many of our current experiences, so that um, this is kind of what happens with a flashback. Maybe you've heard of a flashback in trauma where the person acts as if they're reliving, re-experiencing the original trauma because something reminded their senses of that trauma, like uh, the classic example is the car backfiring for, with the, uh, the soldier who, who interprets it as a gunshot or a bomb or something. There's a, uh, a book by one of the classic uh, you know, authors in the field of trauma called The Body Remembers. So even when the, the mind isn't remembering, the body is sending messages to the person that there's something seriously wrong. How it's interpreted, or at least that's the mind interpreting the body's experience, is that something is seriously wrong. And so then that creates a much stronger reaction than someone who didn't have that previous experience would might have. I was thinking about this, I like this term big T and small t trauma. Um, I think that we've all been living through at least small t trauma lately with the pandemic and, and maybe the recent experience with the fires, which is, can create a powerful sense experience of danger that reduces our capacity for mindful awareness. Um, I was looking at home for a snow globe to bring, but we can imagine a snow globe. I like the analogy where if you shake up a snow globe and agitate it, it's really hard to see anything except all, everything that's swirling and it can take quite some time for that snow globe to settle down for you to, to to have that calmness to be able to see things more clearly and to have that mindful awareness lama calls this small scope or it's not his original idea but he says that i think he said in some of our, his previous talks that we're currently mostly living in small scope and just a reminder of what this means the Lam Rim talks about three scopes for Buddhist practitioners. I'll go through this kind of quickly. Uh, small scope is what can the Dharma bring to my life to make it easier, happier, and more tolerable? Medium scope is how can I use the Dharma for my own enlightenment and liberation? And large scope is how can I attain liberation for the benefit of all beings? And this is the Mahayana scope. So Lama says that big events and situations can move us down from Mahayana scope to small scope. So we can kind of see how someone in chronic pain would be much more likely to, to uh, be living in small scope. Um, and this may just get worse with the pandemic, um, with that chronic stress. Pain, pain doctors are worried that there's going to be higher rates of chronic pain because of this chronic stress that people are experiencing. Um, I know I've been talking a lot, so I want to stop and see if there's any thoughts or questions that people might have before I keep going. I don't see any chats. Okay, so I want to um, talk a little bit about dukkha now. Um, one of the, the dukkha is a hard to translate word, um, but one of the translations is pain. Um, it's also known as the first noble truth, which is that conditioned life is suffering. Um, the Buddha's short definition of suffering was, it was the five clinging skandhas. So the skandhas, I got a little definition uh, from Chen Rinpoche. The skandhas are the five tainted aggregates of a mind 
with grasping for the truly established existence of the peak of samsara. Another way of thinking about it is this the five elements that make up the basis of sentient existence, form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. So each of us experiences the world through these five aggregates, which make up our conscious experience and sense of self as a separate I. The five aggregates also might be seen as the stories that we tell ourselves about the world and our experiences. We overlay meaning based on our conditioning and past experiences, like I was talking about with pain. Um, the meaning is based on the, uh, of the pain is based on the past experiences that we have. So as we saw that the person with chronic pain may interpret a sensation based on past conditioning and flight the, the suffering of that sensation. There's a, a sutra that uh, uses this as an example, or there is, is an example of this. It's the Salatha Sutra. So here it is. When touched with a feeling of pain, the uninstructed run-of-the-mill person sorrows, grieves, and laments, beats his breast, becomes distraught. So he feels two pains, physical and mental, just as if they were to shoot a man with an arrow and right afterward were to shoot him with another one so that he would feel the pains of two arrows. The first arrow is a cause or condition that generates the sensation of pain. The second arrow is our reaction to it, especially if the arrow is filled with resistance, catastrophizing, etc. It's the second arrow that turns the volume knob up on our pain that makes the felt sense of it so much worse. Remember that formula, pain plus resistance equals suffering. So these reactions to pain, uh, I hope I'm kind of helping you see this, can be so conditioned that they feel automatic. And it's, you know, recognizing them, it's, you can't just turn them off like a light switch. It, it, it becomes so ingrained almost. And even though the Buddha taught that conditioned life is suffering, he also taught that there is a way out through realization of emptiness or not self. When the Buddha talked about emptiness, he talked about disidentifying with the five aggregates. Emptiness then is refraining from anything, adding, adding anything to or inferring anything about what you are experiencing. But another way, you perceive things directly, empty of your usual stories about them. This is easy to say, but a little bit harder to do. Um, but not impossible, Lama would probably say it's easy. From a relative standpoint, we can begin, so, you know, what do we do? I, maybe some of you are thinking, yes, this is, this is all well and good, but when you're, in the, when you're really in that pain, um, you want relief. Um, we talk about relative antidotes. So um, from a relative standpoint, we can begin to reinterpret the pain signal to become our motivation for renunciation of samsara and taking refuge, refuge. Just as we suffer, we do not want others to suffer. And so we want to wake up to lead all sentient beings out of suffering. This is uh, a line from, a verse from Shantideva, um, Guide to Bodhisattva Way of Life. The, cause of happy, the causes of happiness sometimes occur, but the causes for suffering are very many. Without suffering, there is no renunciation. Therefore, mind, you should stand firm. Another practice that we can do is Tonglen, where we connect our pain to all sentient beings who suffer in pain. We willingly take on others' pain and give them our compassionate wish for them not to suffer. This helps lessen the self-clinging story of our own pain. Another practice, of course, is Medicine Buddha, which is a healing and purification practice we can use for anyone who is suffering, including ourselves. We invoke the Medicine Buddha, um, we beseech the Medicine Buddha to, to bring healing to us, and um, then we become one, our minds become one with the Buddha's Dharmakaya mind, and then we invoke the Medicine Buddha for all sentient beings. So again, we, we're using it as a healing practice, not just for ourselves, but for, for everyone. So in so doing, we're, we're diminishing that separate sense of self and other. 
and increasing our compassionate wish for all beings to, to be free from suffering. So what's really nice about Medicine Buddha is um, it aligns quite well with the placebo effect that we see in medicine. Um, the power of the mind to uh, promote healing. There, I was reading this morning that up to 30% of um, health outcomes are likely to be placebo. Uh, the person's positive intention um, that they will get better, that actually helps them to get better. And so uh, when we create a positive intention through uh, Medicine Buddha, I know I certainly have had that experience with it where I feel better when I do it and I'm suffering. Um, my, my pain experience is, um, is felt differently, often lessened when I'm using Medicine Buddha. So it's a powerful practice for me. Um, and hopefully for you too, those of you who practice it. Um, Lamala talked about meditating on pain and looking at pain sensations as discontinuous. And as I've said, when we're in pain, we, we make it very solid and project permanence onto it. But when we pay attention in meditation, even if it sticks around for a long time, it eventually morphs into less pain, a different kind of pain, or often an absence of pain. Bodily sensations are constantly occurring. We're just attending usually to the most noxious and annoying ones. We can place the pain in a larger container of all of the bodily sensations, thoughts and emotions, and general perceptions of the sense organs that we have. And we can also see in meditation how we so quickly get caught up in our stories about pain and work on disidentifying with these stories. One of the pioneers in working with pain uh, with meditation is uh, the psychologist John Kabat-Zinn, who many of you have probably heard of. Um, he studied meditation with Thich Nhat Hanh and other Buddhist teachers, and uh, he brought it back to his patients at Mass General Hospital. I think it was maybe in the 70s or 80s. Um, and he developed a secular form of, of meditation that I have to, I don't know if he's actually the originator of mindfulness meditation, but he's certainly one of them the term mindfulness meditation, which is basically um, shamatha meditation. And he studied its effects on various conditions, including pain conditions. And he found statistically significant effects on reducing pain intensity and unpleasantness with mindfulness meditation and developed a treatment called mindfulness-based stress reduction. So that is something you can certainly look into um, if you suffer from chronic pain, this is uh, there's some really good research with um, mindfulness meditation. Um, it may be that Buddhist practice is uh, aligns, so it's not necessary to do the Kabat Zinn's uh, training. But if not, that's something you could definitely look into. He he's big on body scan meditation, where you you go through your entire body and just notice the sensations uh, in each part of your body. And as I was doing Medicine Buddha this morning, I realized um, the part of, of uh, the short practice where you um, um, visualize the, uh, the Buddha, the Medicine Buddha sending rays of light into your body, a blue rays of light that are um, taking away the pain and disease, that's a form of body scan because you're going through your entire body um, identifying areas that then you uh, that the blue light is applied to, so to speak, and uh, so I think that's a nice form of a, of a body scan that can be very helpful. So that's pretty much what I have for you, and I'm just curious if anybody else has any thoughts about how this relates to our practice or how they're using their practice to help with their own pain that they would wouldn't mind sharing. Got a hand, Elizabeth? No? <laughs> yeah? I can't find where to raise a hand. It yeah, used to be. There, but you have the floor. 
Go for it, Susan. Okay, sorry. It used to be under participants, but now I can't find it. Anyway, um, one of I've got you know a a uh, an acute you know that that disc thing you were talking about, like everybody in the world has, and so every once in a while, of course, it just gives me a, a intense pinch, and. I found that if I treat it like I treat anger, um, when anger just grips me, right? And just like, no. Um, and just say, ah, I see you. It's kind of like Mara, you know, I see you. Anger, I see you. Pain, I see you. And just um, sort of acknowledging it in the sense that it is not me, not mine, not myself, but it's Mara. It's an impingement on my tranquility, if you will. So just, um, I, I just try to, and then, you know, then I'll do something about it. I'll, you know, do ice or I'll do some stretching or whatever. But it's like um, not internalizing it. And I'm finding that if I treat it like anger, it, it is helpful. I like that. It's, um, it's not I am pain, but there is pain. It's like disidentifying with the pain. Yeah, it's like that. Yeah, thank you. And anger is, you know, to your point, I think... Um, a similar very powerful experience that uh, creates a, uh, both a clinging and an aversion um, that it's hard to get out of. It's also a very solidifying experience, if you will, that, that sends a lot of stories to us or we create a lot of stories about. So thank you. That sounds good. I like that you, that, that helps you. Hi, this is Autumn. Hi, Autumn. You can hear me, I guess. Yep, I can hear you. Um, this kind of reminds me of an experience that I had. Um, this was before I came to the temple, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. I got these uh, full body hives and it was horrible, so itchy and terrible. And I was going to dermatologists and I was going to allergists and I was washing everything and I was bathing in oatmeal and I was just going crazy trying to get a handle on these things. And uh, I did this for months, and finally I gave up. I just, <laughs> I just said, well, I guess I have hives now, and uh, I'm just going to stop fighting them. And they went away as soon as I, <laughs> as soon as I stopped trying to treat them, which was really weird. I, I by no means have a handle on pain and all of the physical experiences. Um, that I have, but it, at that point, uh, it actually worked to stop fighting so hard because it goes back to what you said, pain plus what resistance. Was that? resistance. Yeah. When I gave up the resistance, they went away and people were always like, I have hives. What do I do? And I'm like, accept them. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> so, anyway. Well, well, I'm glad that, um, you found something that helps. Um, Sometimes the best solution is no solution. Yeah, weird, very, very strange. Well, the resistance um, just is an ex exacerbates it. So um, learning how not to resist seems to me to be really key. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, do other people have, or do you, Susan, or anyone else have um, ideas about how to not resist that really hard experience that everybody naturally wants to resist? Well, I, I had another experience too uh, that might be interesting where I was getting over shoulder surgery and I was getting a frozen shoulder. And you know, you try to do these exercises and it's, you're just so focused on that pain that you start protecting yourself so much. And then I started going to a climbing gym and exercising and they weren't physical therapy exercises, but basically I was doing something fun 
and forgetting about the pain. And then what do you know, like it all got completely freed up and uh, the pain went away too. So maybe there's a way to, um, you know, instead of thinking like my whatever hurts, if you can use your whatever it is in a pleasurable way, maybe that can help. Just a thought. It's kind of a different story that you're putting on the pain. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that really struck me as I was doing the research is um, the perception and the meaning that we make of the experience determines the experience to a large extent. So, um, and it's sad. I think that doctors, it took them a while to, to get that um, it's not a good idea in many cases to rest um, like back pain. You know, uh, they kind of later on realized it's probably better to move with back pain than it is to um, lay in bed, which is what they were initially prescribing to people. But that, that um, I can't do anything because of my pain is a lot of what leads to disability. So that story. Um, actually um, inflates the experience and, and reduces the quality of life. So going like, it may not be the case for everybody, but that's one thing that Autumn, you did that seemed to help you to kind of get back into your life was to not tell that story that, that you can't do it because you have this pain. Hi, Andrew. My uh, name is Trish. Hi, Trish. I don't have my video on. But I could relate on what you said, Susan said, and Autumn said, I have fibromyalgia and I have the beginning of disgeneration dis dis in my spine. You know, I could relate to your talk about, man, I had this set in my head of what I was going to say. <laughs> um, having the resistance to moving and to moving through the pain and it, how I can relate that to my Buddhist practice is I don't want to meditate when I'm in pain. I just, I don't because I'm so identified with my body, so identified with my body. Like I can't even, and I, and then it gets, oh, I know what I was going to say. It gets to the point where I'm protective of my body. So I will sit around or lay around instead of move to avoid pain because I do have some pain-free days, you know. And so on the days that I'm feeling good and it's been told to me by doctors and everything, you got to move through the pain. And I'm just so protective of avoiding pain um, that I just, I don't move even on the good days and I don't meditate and I don't do my mantras and, you know, my practices, my medicine Buddha practice and all that. So that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you're um, really suffering as much as you are. Um, analogy that I've heard that I like is the hand and the face. Maybe you've heard this before, but it's like, Pain can be like this, like if you put your hand right in front of your face, it's kind of all you can see. But as you do things like uh, meditate, do your practices, um, maybe some forms of exercise, psychotherapy sometimes, um, get out and be with friends. It's like, it, it's still there, but it's not the only thing that you're attending to. So it's like, uh, it just opens up possibilities like that. But again, I, I, I hear you, Trish. It, that experience feels so almost all encompassing that uh, it can be challenging to want to challenge it, if you will, and, and, and try these other things that, when it feels so much. Hi, Andrew, this is Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. Hi. One thing that I learned to do probably about 10 years ago that has helped me a lot with what you're talking about is I tend to be so cerebral about everything. I mean, I the way I deal with life is told from my head and that gets me into all kinds of trouble. So I learned to do what they call muscle testing. Um, there's lots of different ways, ways to do it. 
But the way I do it is I just create a little circle with my thumb and my left forefinger. And then I attempt to pull my right forefinger through that little circle that I'm holding. And I, at the same time, I'm asking the question about something. It's like, whatever I'm doing, where I'm getting crazy in my head or some belief structure I have or whatever I'm saying, my own self-talk, then I test it. Is this true or not? And that, that is something I use. I mean, you just talking about this reminded me of how much I use that and how helpful it is and how it keeps me very grounded in what's really happening rather than the mythology that my head is continually manufacturing. I really appreciated your talk. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, if we can alter the story and in, in our interpretation of our experience um, from a relative level, that certainly can be helpful. There's any number of possibilities that, that we can tell ourselves. And we often tend to, to uh, tell ourselves the worst possible story, um, especially when, when we're in pain or we're feeling bad in some way. Our, our minds tend to interpret that um, straight to the worst possibilities. So is that really true and, and challenging that? That sounds like a good strategy that you're using, Susan. I'm sorry, Cynthia. I was looking at Susan. <laughs> Anybody else? The other Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Hi Andrew. Um, I, I love the talk. Um, and I was thinking about, um, and Trish, I'm, I was thinking, feeling for you. And um, as many of you know, I have MS and I also have back pain and, you know, all kinds of pains kind of stemming from years of MS um, and having to walk with a cane and, you know, sort of cascading. Um, so a couple things that have helped me. One um, was, you know, initially my doctors were like, well, th this is a neurological thing. And so physical therapy won't help you because it's, it's damage in your, um, in your brain and on your spine. Um, and that turned out to not be the case at all um, because we started to understand that this is a conversation between among your brain, your mind, and your body, as you were saying, right? Um, and what if you started the conversation with your body? So that's what the physical therapist did, right? So she say, like, we're waking up these muscles, right? Because I had this narrative, I was I adopted the narrative, right? that this is a one-way conversation and you know that part of the um partners in the conversation had left the room so <laughs> anyway so so that that helped to kind of reframe the narrative as you're saying um to open up other possibilities like what if i did move um what if i did try this and um the pain plus resistance equals suffering. Absolutely. I mean, I, I loved Autumn, your example and all the examples you brought up, Andrew. Um, and I have like, when I'm trying to get to this thought, I, oh, that, you know, the resistance is of course fear, right? We're, we're afraid that something bad will happen, that we'll have more pain, that we'll be overwhelmed by it, or that we'll injure ourselves, right? Sometimes that signal is saying, is doing something good for you. Um, but that's what's helped me conquer that fear. And I still do this in physical therapy where like, you know, my, my trainer will say, okay, you know, let go, you're just gonna walk like on a tightrope. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna fall down if I do that. And then so you can hold my arm and then, you know, eventually I let go and it's okay. But I started to think, oh, one of my, I start, I've started to say to the pain or about the pain, it's just pain. It's just pain. Like, okay, so what's the worst case scenario? I'll feel the pain I'm already feeling. Maybe I'll feel, but it's just pain. It's not suffering, right? It's just pain. So that's helped me 
um, for what it's worth. Well, that's that's great. I'm glad. On many many levels, I'm glad that it helps you. Um, I think that uh, it kind of goes back to what story are we telling? And I love that you're telling a story. It's just pain, and we don't have to make more of the story than that. In, in that situation, it it didn't lead to anything more for you. Mm -hmm. So it's a way to kind of keep pain out here instead of right here. Awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, my name is Garrett. Hi, Garrett. Hi, um, I just wanted to thank you for today. And it's, it was kind of strange because I just went through the um, chronic pain program at Kaiser for the last year, a little bit over a year. And um, everything you said was true. And I was kind of felt like I was telling the story with you because I lived through a lot of it. And um, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life because I used to really let my mind get involved too much and make things worse and if nothing else, not get better. And uh, one of the things I've been doing lately is no matter what kind of pain I'm having, it's just trying to feel the pain only and not put any thoughts into it. And um, if I'm lucky enough, sometimes it goes away, but if nothing else, it doesn't add to it, you know, and it keep it going kind of, and it, it kind of dissipates a little bit. And um, I just wanted to thank you for this. This was really special today, because like I said, I just went through this program and I learned so much and it's one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. So thank you for this. Oh, you're quite welcome. Um, I don't know, did you work at all with Les Aria? No, uh, Susan, Susan Pitts at Kaiser in Roseville. Oh, okay. The reason I ask is, um, I did a training with Les, and he works at, I think, the Kaiser Sacramento, and, and he's brilliant. Um, he knows so much about this, and I learned a lot from him. And Kaiser has, um, sounds like, really excellent uh, programs to, to kind of talk about a lot of this stuff, so I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad you got some help there. Thank you. Okay, uh, any last comments, questions? I just wanted to thank you, Andrew, for your talk today. Thank you, it was very helpful in everybody's comments and sharing their how they deal with chronic pain and everything, thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome, you're quite welcome. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, let's go ahead and, and do uh, closing prayers. All right, is there any announcements, Connor? Okay, we're gonna do some announcements after prayer, so please stick around. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, they quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you were the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezik, Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Songkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Thank you. I'm gonna hold the mic for Connor. Oh, push it over, awesome. That works. All right, uh, can we, here, I can just move in a little bit. Okay, cool. Um, hi, so next uh, Monday, so tomorrow night, there'll be Buddha Dharma study program with Lamala. Uh, we're starting Dharma Kirti, so make sure you come. If you haven't done your essays, uh, which I know you haven't done your essays, so please do your essays for the last two books. That'd be great. <laughs> um, and I know none of you have. 
So time to get those in because Dharma Curity is going to be a wild ride. That's a lot of fun. Um, also, uh, if you are interested, uh, Svasti Abbey is having uh, Geshe Yeshe Topki. He's continuing his uh, teachings on chapter two of Dharma Kirti's uh, uh, commentary on the compendium of, oh, I'm missing a word, knowledge. Basically his uh, commentary on Dignaga. Uh, he started chapter two last year, didn't quite get through all of it. So we'll be doing that again, uh, finishing chapter two this year. I think it's the second through the eighth of October. You do have to sign up, but it will be streaming on YouTube, I believe, as well. Um, that's through Sevasti Abbey. Um, Geshe Kopke is just uh, an amazing teacher. Um, the translator is also awesome. I think uh, Catherine Grimes Griggs, um, she's an amazing translator, young woman, uh, really well educated in Tibetan and English, um, and the just the, you know, I, I would have recommend go back and watch her because um, she's really good. Uh, so that's tomorrow night. And then on Saturday, Geshe Damsha is going to be back here at Dona Darge Alliance Roar doing, um, rolling the mantras starting at about 9 a.m. There'll be lunch of some sort at some point, and I don't quite know what we're going to end at, maybe four, maybe five. Look for an email. I have not quite gotten that out yet. Uh, hopefully that'll happen tomorrow. Um, so uh, please come if you can come for a little bit come for a lot uh, we got some more sticks to help with the rolling we've got lots of incense at this time to help with that because we need the incense it's a great community event help build community um and the we're rolling the incense i didn't bring any out here um but we're basically rolling incense uh cubes sort of that go into the buddha um, statue uh, we don't quite have a shot. I don't know, Eli, can you get a shot of just the altar with the, the other camera? Maybe even just with the other one, yeah. Just show it really quick. Uh, the large Buddha statue is not on the altar at the moment um, because we have to do a lot of measurements to know, like, you know, how big is the head? How big is the torso? How big is the leg area? How big is the lotus area and the base to know how big the mantras can be? Um, so Gishla is actually guiding us in all of that so that we can uh yeah maybe we can't quite get it there um but so uh, you know the, the statue is actually in two parts um so uh it's it's a lot of mantras it's a lot of rolling so we roll them we roll them we roll them we wrap them we tape them we glue them, you know there's a whole big process it's a lot of fun there's already a, a video online on youtube it's called Rolling the Mantras with Geshe Dom Show. It's on our YouTube page. You can go watch it. Um, it's fun. There's some interesting commentary on it. Um, it. You know, come on Saturday, help us out. There'll probably be another day or two of doing this just to get it done. Um, but it's a great community event. Wear your mask, social distance um, as much as we can uh, in the Gompa. After um, some uh, Tai Chi is done, we'll probably move into the, the dojo as well, and then uh, have some lunch, meet some people, um, but it, it's great. Hopefully you guys can come. And then on a personal note, this is totally personal, so if you guys don't want to hear my personal business, that's fine, you can go. <laughs> um, uh, I burned my hands this past week, and uh, it's sort of a sad story of my own idiocy, but I need some help. Uh, which means that I can't actually do my own laundry, which I know is the most fun thing to do ever. Uh, but I was wondering if anyone had some time today, if they could help me out with uh, just basically doing my laundry, <laughs> putting it back in my laundry bag. Connor, where do you live? Where do you live? I can't do dishes, um, which is actually oh, you can't hear me. Okay. If anyone has some help, some time to help me with that, I would appreciate it if you have my phone number. Uh, give me a call. I'll stick something in the chat right now. I would really appreciate some help today with that. Um, so let me know. Connor, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Where do you live? And check the calendar for the rest of the events. Oh, okay. Or uh, Lions Roar. Thanks. Bye. Oh, cool.